Thank you. Uh, for lack of a better word, uh, I'd like to thank Frank, Rajat, and Adrian, uh, and, and sorry, Arjit for forcing me to give a talk, even though I'm local organizer. And Frank for making sure I was well hydrated last night. Okay, very good. So this is joint work with uh, Swamik Pal, Raghav Somani, and Raghav Tripathi. Uh, so the orange people are students in Seattle. Uh, the yellow people are faculty in Seattle. Uh, si Wong and Zach are computer scientists and machine learning people. And they are, uh, their, their whole objective is to understand uh, or make sense of how to minimize problems in neural networks. That's their motivation. Okay, so so uh, I just came in the way. So here's my first. Uh, so the, the first problem that I'd like to sort of just recall for everybody is, which you've seen before, is you take a probability space omega fp. As you can see it, okay. I'm sacrificing online audience for you. So, and let H be a function from omega to zero infinity. Uh, so it's like any Hamiltonian. And the objective is to find minimizers of H. This can be computationally expensive to do. Uh, depending on how the, how the Hamiltonian is and how large and discrete your omega is. So what people will do is uh, they will introduce a Gibbs sampler, uh, a measure proportional to, let's say, e to the minus beta times h, uh, run a Markov chain Monte Carlo on this with the sample machine. And the hope and the, and the, the, the theory is that as beta goes to infinity, uh, the chain focuses on the on the it's a concentration on the minimizers of H. So that's one way of uh, achieving. Uh, first, achieve a Markov chain invariant measure Q beta, and then for large beta, the chain should be near the minima and be on your way. This is one thing we've all seen. The second thing we also have seen, uh, which I'd also like to sort of uh, so, yeah, that's right. So, right. So exactly, you can take a Markov chain with invariant measure Q beta, and we know that for large beta, this is going this is going to concentrate on the minimizers, and you hope that the Markov chain converges. And The next problem we've also seen is the following. Omega is Rd. Uh, and uh, here one can run a stochastic gradient descent on the mark on like a diffusion with let's say minus grad h. If h is nice. Where b is brown in motion. And then as beta goes to infinity, uh, uh, this SDE converges to sort of, it sits on the ODE, this, and the fixed points of the ODE are the minimizers of H. And this sort of captures the fast decay if the Hamiltonian possesses it. And, uh, and this is like a gradient flow on, on RT. So there are two problems we've all seen. So the goal of this talk, uh, what I'd like to do in this talk is, uh, or the goal of this project is, uh, to do this whole program, uh, both M1 and M2, when omega is uh, the space of large, dense, weighted graphs. So to implement one and two in, in these two cases. Dense means number of edges per order. Correct, yeah, order in square. Oh, in the graph on theory, like Adrian and Anita talk. The H will be the number of triangles. Yeah, H could be any Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so one could be homomorphic densities, like you like you explained. 
But typically in neural networks, they're not homogeneous. There are some functions of the weights of the graphs. So, so I would like a topology and everything set up to handle everything in some sense. That's right. That's right. So you'll... you'll Correct. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. You need sufficient, for example, even the real line, you need sufficient convexity for it. So, one's done. Okay, so, uh, let me just give you a couple of examples to keep in the background while I do the whole uh, exercise. So, let me write examples down. So one could be, uh, like Remco was saying, you take a finite graph G, uh, you look at the homomorphism densities of, of F and G, number of copies of F. G is a graph on N vertices. Uh, that could be a homo density that Anita and Adrian have spoken about and a couple of other talks as well. And uh, some Hamiltonians we've already seen. For example, uh, in exponential random graphs, you would take the number of triangles minus the number of alpha times the number of edges. That would be a Hamiltonian you'd like to sort of understand and minimize. Yeah, so I guess, let me just, uh, just to sort of uh, spare my agony, I just put alpha one and alpha two. So they're negative and positive. Yeah, by negative sense, positive sense, whatever you want. That's, that's negative, positive, whatever you want to do. I put alpha one, alpha two, they're two real numbers. Yeah. This is one thing that edges. edges and then the other thing that's so let's go classical a little bit uh, to see. So, so I want to understand what graphs are the minimizers, right? So what's the graph? That's what I want, right? So let's go to something very classical, let's say. Uh, I don't know how to prove this theorem, but uh, so let's say you, this mantle turin theorem, where you maximize the edge density given that the triangle density is zero. Uh, this uh, I think is this is one over sixteen or one over one over two, and uh, this is achieved by the graph that is bipartite. And I think this is called the mantle theorem. Some examples like this just have a favorite example in mind. You have a graph, you have a Hamiltonian in mind, you have a minimizing problem, a maximizing problem, and you want to understand what's going on. That's probably the graph. Yes, that's right. So, for example, uh, I forget the person name, Charles Redden. They've done things like this. And of course, neural networks, uh, you, can, you can model them as weighted graph, and your Hamiltonian is some function of the weights. And you want to minimize the loss function, you can model it as a minimizing problem. So that's the main motivation for uh, Somic and, and his co-authors, is to understand this on neural networks. OK, very good. <coughs> Now, uh, let me tell you uh, what all has been, what all sort of has been sort of written up properly, and then I'll come and explain each of them in a second, uh, as I go along. So what we do is uh, uh, we consider we consider two processes, Euclidean optimization. So one of them is uh, is a Euclidean uh, stochastic optimization. Algorithm. This lives on uh, adjacency, adjacency matrix of the graph. So, uh, my pen, no, my, my, my. Just since that's one one particular process we'll, we'll do. The other one, sort of a novel one, which is I think I'll explain in more detail, is a, is a metropolis. Uh, the modified metropolis chain. Uh, since uh, we have learned dense graphs uh, for the last two or three talks before, 
So I will build a metropolis chain on stochastic block models. And uh, I have these two processes I'll have to imitate method one and method two. Uh, and what we'll do is uh, the, the results are the following. Um, so, so we'll show that as n goes to infinity, both these processes will converge to uh, deterministic flows. So these, both these processes will converge to deterministic flows. On, uh, so now I'll up the ante a little bit uh, on, on the so-called measure value graph. So, so that's the that's the broad goal of this whole. Uh, I will have to explain all these things in a, in a, as I go along. This is the goal. Let me spend some time on 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 this page a little bit. Uh, so, if you know graphon theory, uh, so I'll explain this a little later in the talk. There's a connection between graphons and infinite exchangeable, exchangeable arrays, which I will explain. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. But these decorated graphons are in one-to-one -one correspondence with exchangeable arrays. Okay, so, so then one-to-one -one correspondence with infinite exchangeable arrays. Okay. So which I will, I will explain as I go. Say again. What is jointly exchangeable? Uh, permutations. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Let me just slide past that. I'll come back to okay, that. Okay. Yes. So to do this, uh, this this is called this is in lower this is done. This is not new. This this measure by graphons. They called decorated graphons in the, in the work of Lovas and Segedi in, in 2010. Uh, I don't know if it's been published, but at least in archives a copy. Um, so what what we have to do is. What we do is a little bit build on that. So, so we introduce uh, a metric on the space that gives you a natural notion of convergence on measure of graphons, infinite extended arrays. If you go down to the graphon space, it's the cut metric. So the, the projection is natural. So the new metric on the space. That's one thing we do. This is the cut metric pushed up to the level of measure value graphons, formally speaking. That's pretty well, exactly. That's right, that's right, that's right. So every neural network, you can write like a Hamiltonian on a big graph. So that's it, loss function. So then what we also do is uh, we show uh, existence of a, of a gradient flow that the whole problem can be established as a gradient flow on the space of measure value graph, the minimization. So I'll explain all this in my talk. The other things that are there, we show exponential convergence of the metropolis algorithm to minimizer and stability of the problem and so on, under nice conditions on H. Uh, so then there can be and wherever, wherever, wherever you want, wherever you want. Okay, very nice. Okay. So now let me spend some time. Uh, so before coming to this, is uh, this object is also very nice. Uh, we'll try to. This I think is quite nice to see, uh, and sort of unique in this area in some sense. So, uh, so this is a. Because when you think about it, it's sort of the most natural thing to do. But, so this is a metropolis chain, uh, which I like to on the stochastic block model. So I'll just call it uh, SBM.
Also, by the way, I forgot to mention in the beginning, uh, I sometimes speak very quickly. So if you don't follow, uh, you'll ask me to repeat what I said. But if you didn't follow that, it's a big trouble. But, uh, yes, I have techniques to slow myself down, which you'll see soon. But, yeah, but as of now, I've not slowed down yet. Okay. So I have this metropolitan. So here, what I'll do is, so I'll do a little, little, little tweak. Uh, we take a stochastic block model in which there are n times r vertices. Okay, so so I, I'll do this uh, uh, n times r to do two things. So r is the number of communities that I have in the, in the stochastic block model, the discrete one, and I'll have n vertices okay, in each community. So I have R communities, and each vertex has N communities. N vert each, each community has N vertices. And what I'll do is uh, I'll describe Metropolis chain. So Metropolis chain typically what? You have a base Markov chain. After running at some number of steps, you, or sort of design, you have an accept rejection step. And together gives you an invariant measure that resembles the Hamiltonian. Uh, this sort of give, this gives measure. And that's, your, that's the way, one way of constructing them. Markov chain. So I will do that right now. So what I'll do is, so, so let's say, uh, so this is my base chain. So what is the base chain? Let's say you start off with a, with a G0 uh, at time zero, you're in an arbitrary stochastic block model. You start off. So you have N vertices in each community, R communities, you have some edges between them, within them, and some graph. Let's say you, you've run it till time k, and you're at graph g of k. So I'll tell you now what happens at the next step. And just for the, what I'll keep monitoring a stochastic block model, if I want to know everything about it, all I need to know is how does the edge density behave? So, so this is like, I'll call this uh, qn is the number of what each community, r is the total number of communities, and k is the time step. This is my edge density matrix. Correct, yeah. Nodes remain the same, edges change. So what I will do is in the in the in the base chain setup is yeah. So it's just the edge density matrix. So I have I, I'm a time k, so it can maybe I should call it Q and R of K. So. I'm at time k, so white is bad, I guess. But time k and uh, r communities, and each community is an edge density, right? So I put that qr. In so what I'll do is I will independently flip. So let me write it down here. So the base chain, the first step is I'll independently flip. So if the edge is there, I'll, I'll remove it. Edge is not there, I'll put it. I'll flip. Uh, so this I will choose appropriately the parameter, but I'll, I'll call it S n many edges. Okay. This I have to choose later. I will choose later. S n many edges across all pairs. That's what I'll do. So I'll choose SN cleverly. So then at this step, I will get a graph called G. I'll call this graph as, for the time being, as to obtain a, a new graph, I'll call this D tilde of K plus one. Okay. That's, the, that's the graph. After running the base chain, that's where I'm at, my new graph. So you take the edges and then you take the you remove them. Uh, if there's an edge, I remove it. If there's no edge, I place it. I just flip it. Oh, so you I, just, I flip. You just pick as many pairs of nodes and that's then right. you flip, flip the, the edges. Edge. That's right. On off. So now, uh, what I do next is, I I have to design the accept reject step. Of the metropolitan Gautam. So here, what I do is, I will take my graph. So for the time being, this is a little imprecise what I'm going to write down. But for just for the first round of arguments, I will take my graph GK plus one. I'll accept it as G tilde 
Okay, so now here is the difficulty. Let's see how it works. Okay. Yeah, so I, I will write one, just one second. I'll come, I'll come to your question in a second. So, uh, I'll accept this with probability proportional to e to the minus beta times h of d tilde k plus 1. I'm so sorry. I'm writing it so small. But we'll see. Let's see. The probability e to the minus exponent of minus b. Okay, this is horrible. Okay, let's just go. So, is equal to uh, g tilde k plus 1 with probability uh, proportional to e to the minus beta times h of g tilde k plus 1 minus h of g. The standard and plus positive. Yeah. That's right. All of them or yeah, exactly. All, all the flips or none of them. Exactly. Very good. That's right. In this point. And I otherwise, otherwise, like exactly like Frank says, otherwise GK. Uh, to Rajesh's question, uh, so I will have assumptions on H later on, but as of now, H is any general Hamiltonian in mind. And I have to choose, and to just to go to Frank's question, I'll have to choose my parameter beta in terms of N and R as well. There's an R also floating around, which I have sort of under the carpet so far. Again, bit of the alpha. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, go back and write here. Consistent. That's right. That's right. That's right. Beta is a vector. I didn't say beta is a scalar, right? So it's okay. Okay, very good. So. This is the chain. I, I have, there's a small technical step that I'll write down. So maybe I'll just. <coughs> which I will need. So I'll leave this objective as it is. Okay. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, I will use them in, a, in, a, in an oblique way. I'll use them. Yeah. In an oblique way, I will use them. I'll show you how in, in come in a second. So I will need one more step to this modified chain, which I'll write down. It's a technical step. Uh, we call it a, a novel relaxation step. Uh, What here the see the idea is that when you run this Markov chain on this on this space, right? If you look, if you observe the I want to understand as n goes to infinity and r goes to infinity limit. Right? That's what I want to understand. So what's happened to the queues? The queues are edge densities, they're going up or going down. When they hit the boundary, they're going to be pushed down because if they, if they have all edges on, you flip them, they'll come down to some positive number. If they're all at zero, you're going to be pushed up to some positive number. So, so they're they're running formally speaking. These are doing reflected random walks in zero one. So, so if you want to show scaling limits of these objects, uh, your technique must be such that you don't spend enough time at one or zero. If you have local time at one or zero, then the argument becomes much harder to handle in the scaling limit. So for that, I will do a simple relaxation step. that will add some little noise to the to the to this boundary problem. So, so what we'll do is we will just run the base chain. So formally speaking, I'll just run the base chain again. So this is just a technical step, but. Uh, base chain for, let's say, sigma squared times L. So I'll control the control the sig, uh, relation by the parameter sigma squared. So what I will do is here I will call this as gk plus 1 half as this step. And here I will do, I'll run the base chain on gk plus half. And then whatever I get, I accept. So, so this is my net, net result is gk plus 1. So if this the step is bothering you, just don't worry about this. Take it as that's the chain. But uh, I will let sigma go to zero and eventually to get the final answer. Okay. So you're doing something, calling this k plus a half. 
That's right, yeah. And another parameter. Another parameter, that's right. Yeah. So I have several parameters floating around. That's, that's right. That's right. And only based only sort of flipping sigma squared. Flipping again. After after doing this step, I flip it again. After doing this step, I take the graph GK plus half. I run the base chain again, and whatever I get, I take it. I'm adding a little bit of noise to sort of make sure that the local time is the boundary number. Yeah. No, no, no. no, no, no. So, so there are two steps. One is base chain step. Second step is accept reject. Okay. The third step is relaxation. So, so the, you just do some sort of number of uh, explicit scan that somehow you can choose. That's right. That's right. Okay. So here are some interesting notes uh, uh, to sort of keep in mind. Uh, so if you do if you do one and two and not three, then we know from classical theory that the, the invariant measure is the Gibbs measure. That's that we know that. But with three, I do not know what the invariant measure is. Yeah, I do not know. With three, I do not know. That's one nice thing. It'd be interesting exercise to calculate it. Should be doable, but I haven't we haven't done it. I, we tried a couple of times. What you're doing here yeah. was what you were doing too as well, right? Because you were first saying, I'm, I'm taking a bunch of edges, and then after I've done all that, I said, am I going to accept them all? And right. Accept yeah. them right. That sounds to be exactly what you were doing. Right? So why no. still no. You don't do accept reject, you only do edge flip. So you first do edge flips, then accept reject, yeah. then do you then you do a, another set of edge flips, but you don't do this accept reject. You accept whatever you get. You get whatever so you, you get. Don't look at whether or not it increases your homotopy. It's just flips. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's right. Uh, same same edge flips. Same edge flips. Same edge flips. Except, yeah, that's right. So, so it's called a relax, it's a little relaxation step. It's quite cool. Uh, I'll tell you why it happens. Why can't you combine the base chain run of the next integration? Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I'm I, I want to know my state of the graph at k plus one. I want to know gk plus one after the last This is my new state k plus one of the graph. This will, this will correspond to my q and r k. So I'm going to study the q and r k's. This is my new chain. So I want to do accept reject and relax a little bit. I'll tell you why this is it. You can just as of now, you can just you can try to prove the main result without doing this, but we couldn't do it. Okay, so, okay, so first result is the following. That's right. It's not clear. It's exactly. Exactly. It's not clear. It's not, it's not, it's not clear. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You add a little noise, it's not clear. The invariant measure only comes with one and two. The moment you relax a little bit more and accept whatever you get, that's no more in there. That's right. So, okay, what's the first result? So H is nice. I won't write the assumptions on H. Uh, H is nice, some nice function. Convex uh, has a unique minima, let's say. Uh, uh, you look at the edge density, QR and K, QRN. Uh, you suitably linearly interpolate it in time. Just look at the edge densities. They will go to a diffusion. And the diffusion write down. Is dxrt is some drift which I will write it as in quotes as minus the gradient at the rth level of hr dt plus sigma times dbrt. That would be the classical diffusion you will get from a random walk. But here I have boundary effects. I would push the guy inside on the, from zeros and ones on the other side. So I'll have a plus a constraint. So like a local time term. I'll have. So this lives on is a matrix value diffusion on the space of matrices R cross R plus. Where entries are between zero and one. So I have a matrix value diffusion that goes Not yet. Uh, it's just a, I'm just doing the edge density converging to that's all I'm doing. And this is for every LN. So yeah, I have to choose, okay, n goes to infinity, uh, R fixed. So R is fixed, n goes to infinity. Sn, Ln chosen suitably. Yes. How, how do they scale with 
<coughs> it's like so. They enter the fourth is the correct scaling, right? Because n square edges broadly, you'd be careful. It's not not obvious, but it's calculable. It's quite easy. Yes, right. So you have n square edges, right? So let's see some. You have n square edges, right? Broadly. So I, I'm in, okay. Uh, I I I'm I okay. Let me, let me backtrack on that a little bit, but uh, but formally. Yeah, he's in a lot of repetition. That's right. Quite remarkable that you still feel the. Yeah. Uh, is, are my co authors on Zoom? Maybe they can comment on it. <laughs> Lagav, do you know what the Ellen order is? I forgot. They're sleeping as usual. So they haven't said anything. <laughs> so the idea is that, see, when I'm flipping edges, right, if everybody's completely off, I will turn them on, right? So from a constant zero condition, I move the, I move a little bit into the domain, right? But why, why is the relax, I mean, relaxation is just smooth? Yeah. Relaxation is just a step to get the diffusion limit prime. That's all. There's nothing else to it. The constraint out comes automatically from the process itself. There's nothing yeah. So now I've left, I've kept n fixed and r goes to infinity. So from Frank and Adrian's work, we know that this number of flips will not give you a diffusion on graphon space. It will only give you a deterministic flow. So I'd like to capture that as R goes to infinity. So this is like a stochastic block model in which each of the blocks is doing a diffusion with boundary constraints at 0 and 1. That's what this is doing. So it's a stochastic block model where each entry is doing a diffusion up and down. That's one example. That's right. R go to infinity and then see. That's right. Exactly. That's what I want. That's my next agenda. But this you could think of is a, as a as a as a nice stochastic gradient descent on adjacency matrix of graphs of size R. And one cool thing about it is that this diffusion is tracked by the metropolis chain. Yeah, the edges I mean, as a whole. It's, this whole thing is a diffusion on R cross R mate. That, that's a genuine Markov. So that's okay. But each individual guy, you might know other people have because of the Hamiltonian. Yeah. So Ln, I was right. So Ln is n to the fourth. I got it in chat. I was right. So it's okay. n to the fourth. You need so many, so much steps to get past. So n to the no, into the four, power of four, four, that's right, power of four. Okay, very good. But they also say, I think, so I'm not so sure. Okay, very good. So now, this is now, I have, I have put a foothold into this process, which is a Euclidean optimization problem on adjacent matrix. Right? So, okay. so, but this is two things. Now, the next objective is to let R go to infinity. So I've done N go to infinity now. I have let R go to infinity. So that means what I do is I have this, like people already observed, I have this checker box. Each entry is x, i, j of t. And this whole thing is, is my x, r. This, this is what's happening. And then each person is doing a diffusion, interactive diffusion, and has boundary effects at zeros and ones. And this is my stochastic block model at r. I'll put sigma. So now I want to understand what happens as R goes to infinity. So now you have a, you have a you have, this is like a classical graph on theory now. You have finite, your graph at the finite level, that n goes to infinity. The graph on theory will give you what the graph on is in some ways. Uh, so one has to understand that. But I have, I have guys diffusing at the rth level. So if I use a subgraph metric, I should get a deterministic curve in space of graph ons, which is what I meant here. Which I will establish. Okay. So the the if you got confused by step three, the step three is needed to make this rigorous. Uh, somehow we could not do it without the relaxation step. If you didn't have sigma equal to zero, you will get a deterministic gradient flow with constraints on the boundary. We could not get that done somehow. So suppose sigma was zero. 
then this would give you a, a gradient flow on the set of matrices. Uh, we could not get that done. Somehow the, the local time at the boundary for the queues made us do this relaxation symbol. Huh? Suppose sigma was zero, then I have a gradient flow, right? Uh, BXT is minus gradient R plus constraint model. So it's a constrained gradient flow on this case of stochastic block models, right? So one should be able to take one and the chain one and two, let ln and beta n and go to infinity and get that actually done. But we couldn't do it done because the chain spends non-trivial time at the boundary. So I had to flip it, I just adjust a little bit the, the noise. So it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of it's an artifact of the, of the, of the proof strength. That's right. I don't think there's a fundamental thing. Yeah, yeah. Even though we call it novel relaxation step, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. it's an artifact of the technique. In the community model in the limit gives you that's, the that's, that's right. That's the next step. Yeah. So that's the next step. I, I, yeah, you, you'll get the gradient flow. Yeah. We'll show that. We'll, we, that's well defined. We'll show all that. That all, all that works. At the end, you can take sigma to zero and everything makes sense. No problem. Yeah, everything makes sense. All that we'll show in a second. Okay. So now I'll write the result down because I'm running short of time. Uh, then I'll come back and estimate the. Maybe no, maybe I'll just go slowly. It's okay. Since I've set all the objectives here. So. So one cool thing about this is the following. So this is a this is a, a, a bona fide exchangeable array process. Now, if you the issue of going to graphons is of twofold in some sense. So, uh, so but the Aldous Hoover theory, one knows that the exchangeable arrays there is one function that gives the whole array. Right? So you can think of it as the one Borel function on, on uniform, u, ui, uj, and uij. So in law, this particular vector had the same law as, as the xijs. Right? So that's, that's sort of, the Aldous Hoover theory gives you that. as one Borel symmetric function that does this. So in your infinite graph, formally speaking, these are your labels x and y. And this are your edge probabilities, or governing edge probability, I should say. And this person is an extra source of randomness. Formally speaking, that's the exchangeable array connection to run to graph forms in some sense. Fixed T, fixed T, everything's fixed T, T fixed, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no dynamics. So I just call it X sub IP, IP naught. It's fixed T. But then you've already taken R to infinity. That's right. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's that's yeah. right. As of now, this is a, this, yeah, yeah. this is an infinite exchangeable array. I can't think of. So a fixed T naught does look like this. Uh, like what Remco was saying, uh, this is a fixed T. So I should probably put at T. Wait. So, and one recovers the graph form from this by saying that. I condition on the labels, so I look at the law. The moment I condition on the labels, the at, at time t, my so let's say u1 is equal to x and u2 is equal to y, then the graph one is kind of the, the all becomes i all the labels all the xijs become iid, and all I have to worry about is what u1 u12 is right. So u12 could be anything you want. That's the only randomness available, and I fix let's say I fix my bigger randomness to be a constant u. This is just the, the mean of this is just my w u at x comma y. That's how I'll get my graph. Again, at time t, so I have a time t. So this is the Aldous Hoover theory in, in two minutes. So you can get graph on from exchangeable arrays in this fashion. So this I will, I will go quickly over because I'm running short of time. Uh, This correspondence is not one to one uh, because uh, a simple example you can take. Let's say I'll, I'll give an example. This corresponds not one to one because if I take xij's all to be iid Bernoulli half, or I take x, x tilde ij's all to be the constant function half, they both correspond in this setup to the graph on that is constant half. So you lose the one-to-one -one correspondence between exchangeable arrays and graph ones. So there's a fix for this, uh, for doing this, for doing this, getting around this correspondence. 
The fix was devised in Lova and Segedi's paper in 2010. The fix is the following. You don't carry the mean over. What you do is, the fix is that you go here and then each W is now thought of as the law of X1, not the mean. So each W now is not a, a, a number, but it's a probability measure on 0, 1. Each WXY is a probability measure on, on 0, 1. So if you do this fix right here, then you can immediately see that. So let's call this little w as the other graph one. The big one with the law would give you, this person would give you delta 0 plus delta 1 by 2. And this person will give you delta at half. That's two graph ones. So if you do measure value graph ones, this, this sort of, uh, you, can, you can pick out the exchangeable arrays from the, it's a one to one. That's right, this is what I mean. Symmetric measures on uh, symmetric x and y. Basically, a different interpretation of the fact that the automatic that these things are mixtures. Correct. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's right. So, what you do is you just assume that each x, y has a decorated edge on it, so yeah, some distribution. Some exactly. It's not just a zero. So once you do this whole setup, you could think of the now, once you have this measure value graph on space, so I have a measure value graph on, so I won't go into details on this because I'm running short of time. I can impose a, 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 I can make it into metric space. I lift up the cut metric from the graph on space up to the measure value space. That induces topology in exchangeable arrays. And on that topology, one can show that as R goes to infinity, <clears throat> my system will couple, uh, will go to a coupled system of x, uh, all the uniforms, u1, uh, the vector u, uh, u1, let's say, u2, and let's say u12. We'll go to the sy coupled system of this, this entire space. So, from this thing, so what will happen is that the limiting SD looks like dxt. So, once I've conditioned my u to be x and v to be y, so I fix the labels, then my, my limiting SD will look like a McKean loss of SD of the following form. Look like dxt. So for each xy, it's the same SD. Once I fix the labels, it'll be like minus. Now here, okay, here's the next step, non-trivial step. dh, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, dh, I'll show you right here. Let's see, let me go back here. Which here I'll put dx and then dt plus I'll have sigma dbt plus my constraints as R goes to infinity. And here I'll put my measure value graph on. And here I'll have the measure value graph on is in fact the law of this is a making loss of SD with law of xt given u is equal to x and v equal to. This, this is the limiting measure value measure, val measure value graph ons making loss of SD. I haven't explained what DH is. I'll come to it in a second. Uh, so the, that's the last piece in the puzzle, but. Uh, So one completes the final loop, final project in the following. You let sigma go to zero. So you let n go to infinity, r go to infinity, and sigma go to zero, you'll end up getting a gradient flow on the space of graph ones up to equivalences. So I'll, I'll, I'll fill this gap in a second. And the gradient flow will look like dWt is equal, or wt is equal to at xy is equal to w0 of xy minus 0 to t dh of ws of xy ds plus some constraints.
last two minutes, I'll, I'll just explain one last non-trivial part of this whole puzzle. So on the space of graphons, if you look at the cut metric, there's no hope of differentiating the, a function h. There's no derivative as such. So what you have to do is you have to differentiate not in the cut metric, but in the, in the L2 metric, which is a stronger metric than the cut metric on the space of graphons. So use the L2 metric to define your freshly derivative of function h. That gives you a, a dh. And this is a flow on the L2. And the L2 metric is a nice space, like, a, like Richard was talking about. This is a, the ambrosio gigli savare theory applies. And these are well-defined absolute continuous curves on that metric space. Yeah, I guess I've thrown a lot, uh, but so just to just to summarize the whole thing. So, so I start off with a, a metropolis chain on, on a stochastic block model with R communities and N vertices. I let N go to infinity. I got an, a stochastic optimization problem on R cross R matrices. So that looked like a a graph on R, R cross R block with each guy performing a diffusion. As R goes to infinity, I get a, a deterministic curve on the space of measure graphs. And I let my relaxation parameter go to zero, I get a gradient flow on this. So now you have several options. You can either take your gradient flow on, on graph on space and find a minimizer of H, that's one way of doing it. Or you can track your uh, metropolis Markov chain on finite graphs with R communities and N vertices and find the minimizer using the Gibbs measure. Or you can take your diffusion and find your stochastic and different optimization problems. Yeah. They're all the same thing. Does any of them work? Yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, the mantle theorem, in our paper, we have simulated the mantle theorem theorem. It works in all three settings. You can show that. So the metropolis chain converges, the chain converges, can show Of course, H has to be very nice. Right? So I haven't said what H is. Yeah. That's right, that's a problem. Yeah. Thanks, Amindu. Yeah, that's right. Not done yet. So I think for a large, larger class of functions, it works, but you're right, it's highly non-convex. Right? So also, if you have multiple minima, you're... Uh, but there is hope. I think my co-authors are doing this. I'm not doing it. So, yeah. They have one, they have, they have another paper coming up on scaling limits of new networks, which will, which will classify this correctly, I think. Yeah. The uniqueness to the optimal is converts. Yeah, yeah, you can show, you can show, you can show many, many things. You can show, for example, uh, uh, the the. So this this depends on sigma. Uh, so as sigma goes to zero, this will track wt very closely. Wt will track to minimize. This is this classical stochastic operation. It will work like just like that. So. That's right. I haven't said you need some some strong convergence assumption. So I suppose we're already in the Q and A session. Is that right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. First, let's thank uh, Siva for his talk. Okay, any further questions? Let me give you the microphone. I think you wanted to get to the minimizer, but when you look at that equation and have the constraint also there, are you still guaranteed that you would go to the minimizer of That's the... Right. Uh, so we are able to show that Wt will go to W star as t goes to infinity, where W star is the minimizer of, of H, and H of Wt, H W star also goes to zero exponentially. Are there some conditions on the uh, pushback into yeah, the Yeah, so the pushback I didn't write down. You can, you can write down explicitly. It's just the local time at one, uh, local time at zero, uh, minus the local time at one. That's all it is of the SD, formally speaking. You can write down explicitly. Frank? How much are you tied down to the specific uh, mechanism that you use to do the dynamics on the finite? graph before you pass to, to the limit. So could you, could you make that uh, much more general and still uh, fit this into your whole uh, program? Right, the, the program will, this, this, okay, right, that's very good. So uh, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, mention this. So you take a graph on, you have a, a finite graph on from it, right? Because you take N vertices, put labels, W, U, I, U, J will be current. So now on that N step graph on, you can define an honest to God gradient flow on Rn squared. Right? X. Now, these my co-authors have shown it that the, that discrete guy goes to the limiting guy. So that's any 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 mechanism. Okay, so so basically your your can be very general. 
That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they've also shown that uh, this, this measure of other things, uh, which I didn't explain Remco asked in the beginning, that is H just a function of the homomorphic densities? It can be anything. It can be W squared XY times W cube UZ, and it can be anything. I integral them. It doesn't have to be homomorphic density for this whole thing to work. Um, I had a question about uh, the following. So you, you, want to, you want to get convergence to minimizers. Of course, thinking of this gradient flow theory, you have this uh, convexity constant That's kappa right. that determines how fast this is going. And, right. and this, I think, you should be able to get from your uh, function h. That's right. Now, the function h that you started out with, um, for, for me, looked difficult. So have you like a clear pathway to... to uh, I don't understand the last part. So have you, uh, do you have a clear pathway to go from your function h to the, to the, um, the constant that determines how fast you get convergence? Is that easy I don't to know if you have computed the constant precisely, but uh, but, I, but then you have an upper bound somehow. Yeah, upper bound definitely. Sure. Okay. So we can, nice. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good paper. Yeah. All right. Then over the questions, let's thank Siva again.